Welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're going to decode a foundational piece of technology that pretty much makes our high-speed digital world possible, 8B slash 10B encoding. It's the hidden genius behind some of the most important standards we've ever used, from the early days of PCI Express all the way to USB 3.0. All right, so here's the game plan for today. We're gonna start with the big problem. Why sending data really fast is, well, really hard. Then we'll look at the super clever solution, 8B slash 10B. We'll dive into how it keeps everything perfectly balanced, walk through the actual step-by-step -step process, and finally, wrap up with why it all matters and the legacy it left behind. So let's kick things off with the fundamental challenge. You see, when you're trying to send billions of bits a second down a tiny copper wire, just blasting the raw ones and zeros, yeah, that doesn't really work. You run into some serious physical problems that can just scramble the whole message. And this right here, this is the perfect way to think about the first big problem. For a piece of hardware on the receiving end, a long string of the same bit, like a bunch of zeros all in a row, is just a monotonous hum. It's impossible to keep the beat. The receiver's internal clock starts to drift, and pretty soon it has no idea where one bit ends and the next one begins. This visual just nails it, right? That flat line on the left, that long string of zeros, it's a total nightmare for the receiver's clock. There are no reference points to stay synced up, but look at the stream on the right. It's constantly flipping between one and zero. Those transitions create a steady rhythm, basically embedding a clock signal right inside the data itself. Okay, so problem number two is something engineers call DC balance. Think of it like this. If you send too many ones or too many zeros in a row, a tiny bit of electrical charge actually builds up on the wire. This is called DC wander, and it messes with the voltage levels, making it really hard for the receiver to tell a one from a zero. This causes errors. So keeping that electrical balance is absolutely crucial. So you've got two huge problems. How do you fix them both at the same time? Well, some very clever engineers came up with an elegant solution, 8B slash 10B encoding. And the core idea is brilliant, really. You trade just a little bit of your bandwidth for a ton of reliability, a rock solid connection. So at a high level, here's the deal. For every eight bit chunk of data, you know, a standard byte, we translate it into a special 10 bit symbol before we send it out. And these aren't just two random bits we're tacking on. Oh no, it's an intelligent translation that creates a code that's way, way more durable for high speed travel. This new format was designed with three big goals in mind. First, guarantee those frequent flips between ones and zeros to keep the receiver's clock perfectly in sync. Second, maintain that super important DC balance. And as a really cool bonus, it also gives you these special control characters or K codes that you can use for things like signaling the start of a data packet, which keeps them totally separate from your actual data. Now, there's always a catch, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. Sending 10 bits just to represent 8 bits of data means you're using 20% of your total bandwidth on overhead. But back in the day, for standards like PCIe 1.0 and 2.0, that was a price well worth paying for a stable, high-speed link. Okay, so this is where things get really clever. How does the system actually keep all those ones and zeros in check? How does it maintain that balance? Well, it all comes down to a concept called disparity. So first up is this term disparity, and it's actually super simple. It's just the difference between the number of ones and zeros in one of those 10 bit symbols. So if a symbol has six ones and four zeros, its disparity is positive two. Simple as that. Now, some of these 10-bit symbols are just perfect. They're perfectly balanced right out of the gate. They have five ones and five zeros, so their disparity is zero. We call this neutral disparity, and sending one of these doesn't affect the overall balance of the line at all. And this, 
This is the secret sauce. It's called running disparity. Think of it like the encoder's short-term memory. It's constantly keeping a simple tally, asking, hey, have we sent more ones or more zeros lately? This state, which is either positive or negative, is what the encoder uses to decide which version of the next symbol to send, constantly pushing the whole transmission back towards that perfect 50-50 balance. Okay, time to see how this all bolts together. Let's get into the nitty gritty of the actual encoding process. We're gonna take a single 8-bit byte and follow it through the whole journey. So we're gonna start with just a regular old 8-bit byte, any piece of data, really. We've just labeled the bits A through H so we can keep track of them. Okay, so this five-step dance is really the heart of the whole thing. First, as you see in step one, we take that 8-bit byte and just split it into a 5-bit chunk and a 3-bit chunk. Easy enough. Then, in steps two and three, each of those gets its own special encoding. The 5 becomes a 6, and the 3 becomes a 4. But here, here's where the magic happens in step 4. The encoder takes a look at that running disparity we talked about. Is the link currently leaning positive with too many 1s, or negative with too many zeros? And then, based on that answer, for the grand finale in step 5, it chooses which version of the encoded symbols to use, the one that will push the balance back toward the middle. Then it just stitches them together into the final 10-bit code and sends it on its way. Brilliant, right? And this table, right from the PCIe spec, shows this in action. It's perfect. Just look at the input byte. It's the exact same in both rows, all zeros. But if the running disparity is negative, meaning we've sent too many zeros lately, the encoder says, okay, Time to balance things out, and it picks a symbol that's heavy on the ones. That flips the disparity back to positive. And if it was already positive, it does the exact opposite, sending the zero heavy version. Same input, completely different output, all in the name of perfect balance. All right, so we've seen the how. Let's zoom back out and talk about the so what. What was the real world impact of this super clever scheme, and where does it fit in today? You know, the really beautiful part of this whole system is that going backwards, the decoding is super, super simple. The receiver just gets a 10-bit symbol, does a quick lookup in a table, and bam, it has the original 8-bit byte back. Because the code was designed so carefully, there's no confusion. Each valid 10-bit symbol can only map back to one possible 8-bit value. And you can see just how critical this was right here on the PCI Express timeline. I mean, 8B slash 10B was the absolute bedrock for PCIe 1.0 and 2.0. But as we got faster and faster, that 20% overhead started to feel pretty heavy. It became too expensive. So by the time we got to PCIe 3.0, the industry made the jump to a way more efficient 128B slash 130B scheme. And now... Look at PCIe 6.0. We're at something called 1B slash 1B encoding, which is insane, but it needs way more complicated tech to solve the same problems that 8B slash 10B handled so elegantly with just math. All right, so let's boil this all down. What are the big things to remember? At its heart, 8B 10B encoding was this brilliant fix for two major physics headaches in high speed communication, keeping the clock in sync and maintaining that DC balance. It was really the foundational tech that made the first wave of things like PCI, SATA, and USB 3.0 even possible. And the only real price for all that reliability? That 20% hit to your bandwidth. And that kind of leaves us with a final thought, doesn't it? 8B, 10B encoding, it was a masterpiece of engineering for its day. It solved these huge physical problems with just pure, elegant logic. But, you know, the demand for more and more speed never, ever stops, which means the hunt for the next brilliant, even more efficient solution is always on.